Our next speaker is Jeff Rosa. Jeff is the current Executive Director of the Ohio Occupational Therapy, Physical Therapy, and Athletic Trainers Board in Ohio. Jeff has been with the board since 2003. Prior to joining the board, he served as a legislative regulatory specialist with the Ohio Board of Nursing. He also spent six years as a budget analyst with the Ohio Legislative Service Commission, which is the Ohio General Assembly's nonpartisan research office. In addition to his duties as Chief Administrative Officer for the OTPTAT Board, Jeff currently serves on the Board of Certification's AT Regulatory Conference Planning Committee, a native of Long Island, New York. Jeff holds a Master's of Public Policy from the Gerald Ford School of Public Policy at the University of Michigan, and a Bachelor of Arts in History from Yale University. Jeff Rosa. Well, good morning. Um, pleased to be here. And really, I'm going to build a lot on what Dave presented previously, as well as some of the discussion from the updates this morning really tie in nicely with this whole idea of the actual process in writing your rules and regulations. And the key thing to really understand is ultimately, even though the underlying principles about adopting administrative rules are going to be the same regardless of what jurisdiction you're in, as Dave pointed out, the actual process itself is going to differ greatly among the states. So depending upon what state you're in and how the structure of your board set up, the process, it's going to look a lot different. So like in Ohio, we have a process, we're an independent board, but first we have to go through a business impact analysis to determine what is the impact on small businesses. Then we go through a legislative review committee. Thankfully in our state, it's more about did we comply with statutory intent? So typically it gets rubber stamped in, in Ohio at, at that point. But obviously it's important to understand as either whether you're representing your association or you're one of the regulators in the room, as your profession or your board is going through this process, understanding all the different steps in that process in your state are going to be critical in ensuring that the issues that will help improve the regulation of athletic training in your state will actually be able to be adopted into regulation. So the key thing to understand, this is almost that whole um, how a bill becomes a law slide. The first thing is your statute is adopted by the legislature. The rules are adopted by the board, and the purpose of your administrative rules are to clarify what is in the statute. So ultimately, if the board does not have statutory authority to adopt a rule, it is not legally able to adopt a rule. So for example, in Ohio, our practice act says the athletic trainer has to practice pursuant to a referral from a MDDO, DPM, dentist, PT, or chiropractor. We have often gotten questions from our licensees, why can't the board just in the rules say that we can accept referrals from physician assistants or advanced practice nurses? As much as the board may support making that kind of change to our rules and regulations, since our statute is clear on who an athletic trainer may accept a referral from, the board legally could not adopt a rule that says, well, in addition to this whole list of individuals, you also can accept referrals from the PA or the APRN. So it's important to understand what your law will allow you to adopt within your administrative rules. And then it's important to also understand, since your mission as the board is public protection, all of the rules that you're adopting should be based on the mindset of what is in the best interest of the consumers of athletic training services within our state. But I often, whenever I'm talking to groups of professionals, point out that it's critical that the board does not regulate in a vacuum. That even though our mission may be public protection and we're thinking about what is the impact of this potential regulation on the consumers of athletic training services, it's critical that we be mindful of what is the potential impact of a potential rule on the individuals that are directly impacted by these regulations. So it's critical that we be looking at what is the potential impact on the profession. Because at the end of the day, 
overregulation is just as bad as underregulation. Too often, you know, those of us that are full-time regulators, so I know there's a handful of us in the room, we like to regulate because that keeps us employed. But it's critical that we be mindful that if we overregulate a profession, we are not doing a service to the consumers of that profession services. So we need to be mindful. So that's why it's critical that as we're looking at effectively and efficiently regulating the practice, we look at things like what are potential barriers that we have adopted in our rules over time that maybe it doesn't make sense to continue to have this kind of regulation in place. So identifying what are those barriers and then ultimately looking at the potential consequences on the profession. So ultimately, like in the Ohio example, we have five board members. They represent you know, a variety of practice settings, but as they are looking at those kinds of issues, we need to be looking at what is that potential cost-benefit analysis of this regulation. And when I'm talking in this sense of the cost-benefit analysis, it's not as much of the fiscal cost-benefit analysis that Dave had touched on. It's more this idea that will help the board determine, should we go forward with this change? So ultimately, in our mission of public protection, if a potential change will have a significant benefit to the consumers, and so on that public protection part of the scales of justice, we have a significant benefit to public protection. Unless there's a pretty negative impact to the profession, I would always recommend to the board, you really should go forward with that potential change because the significant improvement to the consumer and to the public really warrants you making that change since your mission is public protection. However, if there's a certain change we're looking at, there may be a you know, minor benefit to public protection, but it has a very negative impact on the profession. I would say to the board, you should never go forward with that kind of change because really the benefit that we're getting for the consumer wouldn't outweigh the potential negative impact on how the profession can be practiced. So that gets into that idea of, are we potentially over-regulating the profession when we're not really getting a clear benefit to the consumer? The challenge for boards, and this gets a lot at you know, Dave's portion of the presentation with working with the stakeholders, is what happens when there's, you know, there's some marginal benefit to the public protection component based on this change, and there is you know, a minor negative impact to the profession. What happens then? And often that's where you see all of the stakeholders really need to come together and say, maybe what the board is considering could be modified in a way that still gets the board what they feel is appropriate for public protection, but also addresses some of those negative consequences that the representatives from the profession or some of the other key stakeholders had. So really, it's, it's this idea of balancing those scales of the benefit to the consumer and public protection versus the consequences and negative impact to the profession. Because at the end of the day, that is the whole purpose of regulation. The purpose of regulation is to ultimately limit um, how the profession is practiced. And it should be limited in a way that allows the profession to practice to the full extent of their education and knowledge within the safeguards that are established to make sure the consumers of the profession services are receiving safe services. And that, that statement doesn't just apply to athletic training, it really applies to any profession that is licensed by a given state, whether it's a healthcare profession or a non-healthcare profession. That ultimately is why professions are regulated and why boards should be adopting rules in this kind of manner. It's also critical when you are going through your rule review process, you make this an open process. At the end of the day, if we do not make the rule writing and development process an open process, you're getting into that problem of regulating in a vacuum. So as I said before, the Ohio board, we have five members on our board, four ATs and one physician member. Those five individuals cannot represent the entire breadth and depth of athletic training practice in the state of Ohio. So those of you, and I know we've got some Ohio representatives in the room, those of you that aren't familiar with Ohio, we are a pretty diverse state. It's, it's pretty compact, 
But you go to southeastern Ohio, it's the Appalachian part of the state. We've got a few major metropolitan urban centers, a lot of more just general rural areas. What may make sense in central Ohio may not make sense in the southeastern part of the state. And if we don't have any of our board members that are practicing in the Appalachian part of the state, what they may say, this makes perfect sense, I think this is a great regulation, it serves to protect the public, it may have a lot of unintended consequences, but if we don't hear from our stakeholders who are gonna be directly impacted by these rules changes, the board may go ahead and adopt that rule without ever understanding oh, this is going to cause a lot of problems for a lot of our licensees in certain practice settings, in certain geographic settings. That's why the process has got to make sure that you are going to be including all of your stakeholders in this process. So, so for my Ohio people in the room, they know that they probably get three or four emails from me throughout the entire process as we were going through rule development to make sure that, hey, send us your comments. The board needs to hear your comments so that we know if we need to make changes on something that we think is a great idea, but maybe we have not thought about some of these unintended consequences. So it's critical that, one, if you're the regulators in the room, you make sure you reach out to your stakeholders. And if you are the professionals in the room, if you know when your board is going to go through that rule review process, if they're not reaching out to you, you need to be reaching out to them. A lot of times, some of our greatest rules that we've ended up adopting hasn't been something that the board necessarily was thinking about. It's because we had some of our licensees approach us and say, has the board considered making this change to the rules that we think this would be in the best interest of our practice? I'm going to talk a little bit about a scenario that we recently had. And it ties to this idea of being forward thinking when you're drafting your language. So you do not want, as the board, to have to go back to your rules every single time there's some small change in terminology. The goal of what you want to do is make sure your rule language is broad enough that it addresses a lot of the issues, but also you know, deals with some of the things that you need to get dealt with. So for example, right now, this goes back to the mutual recognition um, issue. We got a request from, um, it was OU, they've got a post-professional KD accredited program. And they approached us saying they had some students from Ireland that as part of their Irish education wanted to come do some of their clinical field work in Ohio. Would that be permitted? And so we looked at our rules and said, the way the rule is drafted now no, because we have defined a student that is, you know, we have an exemption to licensure for students pursuing their academic field work, but it applies to a student at a KD accredited program. So, you know, these Irish students are, wouldn't be eligible. We said, but you know what? Looking at how our statute is worded, we think we can modify the language of our rule to allow for these Irish students to be able to come over and do some of their academic field work experiences in Ohio. The first thought was, well, we'll just say, you know, if you're a student from Canada or Ireland, then you, you would meet the standard of what we're defining as a student who's exempt from licensure. But we realized if the BOC next year enters into an MRA with Australia, and then two years they enter an MRA with um, England, Every time they've entered into a new MRA, we'd have to go and modify our rules to just keep adding countries to the list. So instead, we just use this broader language that if the student's enrolled in the AT program in a country that has entered into an MRA with the BOC, now I, I understand from especially how Denise described really the country has not entered into the MRA. It is you know, the, the certifying bodies in those countries. Um, but that way, if the BOC were to add additional countries and have new MRAs, we won't have to go and keep modifying our rules because our current rule was drafted with broad enough language to allow for changes to practice without needing to keep going back and changing the rule. Also 
Understand that these administrative rules, they carry the weight of law. So it's not just the statute. So when I talk about you know, the Athletic Training Practice Act, we're talking about both the statute adopted by the legislature and the rules adopted by the board, because both carry the weight of law. That's why it's critical that when you are coming up with the actual language, grammar matters. A missing comma can really change the meaning of what your regulation does. Shall versus may has a major difference between what your rule does. Understand, as you are going through that language, you need to fine tooth that language, fine, use a fine tooth comb to go through that language, work with your attorneys to make sure that language is saying what you want it to say, all the punctuation is correct. We actually had a, there's actually a legal case in Ohio in the past few weeks, it was a traffic citation, a city ordinance didn't have a comma, so between the word motor vehicle and trailer, there was no comma. The person was arguing that this ordinance only applied to a motor vehicle trailer, not to a motor vehicle. The court ruled that, yeah, because that comma was not in the statute, basically this, the law did not apply to her, so this, the city now has to go back and fix their ordinance if they want it to apply to people. So it could happen at the criminal, at this more the city level. It definitely happens at the regulatory level also. So make sure as you are drafting that language, make sure that punctuation is correct and understand what the difference between shall and may is. And then finally, work with your stakeholders. And this is really all the things that Dave said. And your stakeholders, be broad in who you think your stakeholders are. Your stakeholders are not just the state AT association. It's going to be the educational programs in your state if you're looking at rules that are going to potentially impact them. It's going to be potentially KD. It's going to be the BOC, other professions. You know, your, as Dave said, your rules could have an impact on other professions that are licensed in your state, other state agencies. And then ultimately, the legislature is one of your big stakeholders. You need to make sure that you don't do something that's going to cause them to say, hey, We've got this out of control board that we may need to fix their practice act to sort of neuter what they can do since they are doing things that we, the legislature, don't think is appropriate. So, so just keep all this in mind and thank you for your time.